and thank you all for hanging around all day. And uh, I think I'm sort of the happy hour of the presentation. So um, I'm the CEO of uh, Indavo Media. Um, CEO means a couple things. So number one, I'm going to keep it pretty light, uh, probably pretty brief. And I'm only going to drill down uh, so deeply. So I've heard a lot of really good discussions uh, today, some good drill downs on digital, uh, digital asset management and content creation and, and management of that. We're on the distribution side of that. Um, uh, in other words, OTT, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, so let's see how, uh, how that goes. So first of all, um, OTT, quick show of hands of those who uh, know what the term OTT means. It's a pretty good chunk. A little round half, maybe. Um, so o o OTT means over the top. And it was a, a term, not the most consumer friendly term, but a term that was sort of derived as uh, content creators and, and, and uh, content began uh, being delivered over the top of other people's networks, particularly um, companies like Netflix and, um, uh, and others who are doing that. Um, it, it's sort of, so it's really two things. Online video has been for, around for a while. But um, over the top really came about when um, the models began changing and companies began deciding you, to use the internet to, take a, uh, to make a direct to consumer relationship and start to build business models with um, consumers directly. And probably the best illustration uh, of the differences between the old pay TV uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, what became TV everywhere and then over the top would probably be HBO. HBO, of course, uh, a long time ago, uh, and still has a, uh, a pay TV service. Uh, you can subscribe to that uh, as a premium through your cable provider. Um, then they um, decided to uh, offer that service um, over different devices um, if you authenticated and uh, were a, a, a cable provider, and that's TV everywhere. Um, so that they, they, they uh, named that, um, uh, that service HBO Go. Uh, but then uh, in the last year or so, HBO decided to go direct to consumer and they developed a service called HBO Now. So now you can uh, actually go online, subscribe to HBO without having a, a cable uh, subscription at all. That's over the top. So it's two things. It's delivering over the internet to all the different devices um, that support that, but it's also the direct to consumer uh, relationship. So. Um, to give you a little bit of history, um, but not to bore you too much, um, if you go back and look in the last, let's say, 10, 11 years, an incredible amount has happened in the world of video um, in a very short amount of time. It's a very, very quickly emerging market. Um, some of you may know YouTube, um, obviously pretty much a household name. They were launched in 2005, so 11 years ago. Um, it first, uh, it fir first launched Netflix. Uh, changed from a or, or began transitioning from a DVD movie company delivery company to um, digital in 2008. Um, Roku came along and uh, offered a, a set-top box uh, to carry the Netflix service, and obviously now has expanded um, uh, extremely well. At, I think something like 15 million of those boxes are in U.S. U.S. households now. Um, uh, in beginning in 2009. And then as recently as just a couple years ago, um, House of Cards, um, uh, if any of you know that show uh, on Netflix, uh, won an Emmy um, the first time uh, in 2014 for a, uh, an online service or an OTT service uh, to get nominated to win a, uh, an Emmy Award. Um, lots of substantial milestones and just uh, proof that uh, OTT has come an incredible amount of uh, distance in um, really in just a short amount of time. And, and the stats are beginning to, uh, to show that. So 79%. Um, this is uh, Cisco's uh, number. I think they have a new one uh, published recently. They, they put out a, a, a report annually called the VNI, um, the Visual Networking Index, that basically tracks traffic and usage and also makes predictions on uh, globally about what's happening with internet traffic. And they, they say that by uh, within the next year or two, um, roughly 79% of all internet traffic will be video. Um, and uh, uh, I think I, I was actually just reading back there a little while ago um, that uh, uh, by 2019, they're saying that 90 percent, up to 90 percent of all Internet traffic is going to be video. So obviously huge, huge impact on infrastructure, uh, on um, content, on consumers, uh, really all of it. And then the Y represents uh, millennials, Generation Y. Uh, this is a generation um, that is really leading the paradigm shift in how consumers consume content. 
generation uh, wires. How many millennials are out there? I know I've seen a few. Uh, <laughs> many, <laughs> many millennials um, never had a pay TV subscription. Uh, arguably never will. Uh, certainly many or most of them won't. I have two millennials as children and uh, uh, they certainly have uh, little or no interest in sort of traditional TV and they haven't for years. It's all about YouTube, it's all about Roku, it's all about Chromecast, it's all about uh, Twitch and Twitter and all, all the different things, uh, but it's not TV. So uh, their habits uh, are really changing the face of um, TV but also media and entertainment. We're not just talking about television, as happens to be one of the areas that we sort of focus on, um, but uh, this, all, all of this that's happening, all of these trends and this massive uh, shift in how we consume content uh, is, is, is and is going to affect um, all of us, whether you're uh, a for-profit um, TV network or a content creator looking to build a business or even nonprofits, museums, uh, libraries, we've heard from a lot of these people, government agencies uh, today. Um, th this, this shift is affecting everyone from a distribution standpoint. And uh, the money's following. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I'm CEO, so I'm, fo I'm focused on a couple things, market opportunity, the money, the business side, business models. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, where my presentation sort of hovers around. But um, this is a recent Informa, um, uh, uh, study that is showing, you know, the, the, the growth in all the different um, business models that are emerging uh, for over-the-top services. So obviously advertising, subscription, transaction, SVOD, which is subscription video on demand, um, has really uh, begun to, uh, to take hold, um, largely due to the big game changer, which was Netflix, um, like I showed before. Netflix really changed the game. It was really the first time uh, on a mass scale that people were willing to pay for an online video service as, as a replacement and or supplement to their TV, uh, to their pay TV service. And that really changed the game. And so then you've got uh, companies that have uh, 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 either in parallel or followed along, Hulu, Amazon Prime, uh, you name it, and uh, there are many, many companies uh, that are getting, getting into um, the OTT game um, and taking advantage of these, uh, these massive trends. Um, but, I, you know, I, th I think that this, uh, what, what, what it's doing, though, is it's opening up the floodgates. Um, so whether you're a, uh, a niche um, a creator of content or you have a library of content that has value and uh, has an audience out there, over the top does a lot of different things. It lowers the barriers of it, barrier of entry from a distribution standpoint. It, 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 it uh, increases your market reach. It increases your ability to target that market. Um, just all the different things that make a business run, OTT um, sort of opens up those floodgates to anyone, even if you're not a Netflix or a Hulu or, you know, the big, uh, the big networks who are also going over the top. So this is not a political endorsement, but this is going to be huge. <laughs> and, and to the, uh, you'll, you'll see at the very end, too, um, I think we had two copyright attorneys in the audience. I have my photo credits at the end, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All came from Flickr. <laughs> but why is this important? Actually, uh, another side comment. This is probably a guy I might would rather be running for president right now. If you know who this is, this is Frank Underwood, <laughs> who is uh, the House of Cards, uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, House of Cards lead actor. Um, uh, you know, why, why, why is all this important to, um, to all of us? Because um, as he would say, treading water is the same as, as drowning. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, the tide is rising uh, very quickly in terms of um, you know, over the top and how content is being uh, redistributed across, um, you know, across the world. So um, your audience is changing. <laughs> so this is not a millennial, <laughs> but, appar <laughs> but apparently he's a, uh, he's a cord cutter. <laughs> or maybe he's a cord, maybe he's a cord cutter. But the, it's, it's important. There's, there's the really three uh, sort of aspects of, of, of why all this is important. And, and the first one really is that your audience is changing. Where, they're, where when, how, and why they are consuming content, uh, no matter what that content is, whether it's for informational purposes, for entertainment, uh, you name it, it's changing and it has changed. And those people in the growing audience, I mean, millennials represent the largest demographic in the United States um, as a group. Um, and they're not watching content the way we used to watch content. I'm in the MTV age. I want my MTV. Before that, it was American Bandstand or whatever, and then it was YouTube, and now it's Netflix, and it's you know the the the, 
the, the floodgates have opened in terms of how uh, you know, uh, the younger generations are, um, and even the older generations, uh, the ones who drink the Kool-Aid like myself, um, consume content. It's all, it's all really become different. So it's really important for us to understand that um, when it comes down to uh, you know, all the hard work that, you, you know, that we're seeing being done on uh, creating content, managing content. A lot of this uh, conference is around digital asset uh, management. Um, distribution is, is, uh, is and uh, like I said, going to be a crucially important aspect of um, monetizing or deriving whatever ROI means to you out of that content. And then my favorite word in the world is disintermediation. So OTT um, has really uh, disintermediated the distribution channels. It used to be you go out and create a movie or create a TV show and you need to go, to the, go through the production studios, uh, certainly go through the networks in hopes of getting you know, picked up on TV, uh, in hopes of somebody watching it on that television. Um, obviously this has completely changed. Content creators now have the opportunity using over the top and using similar mo me uh, uh, methods, models, um, to, to go direct to consumers now. And, uh, and that's a huge change from just uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And um, then lastly, the money. So uh, whether it's for profit or whether it's um, ROI, uh, the business models are changing. Um, as I showed uh, with the Informa um, study, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very massive growth market that is beginning to develop uh, in terms of subscriptions, subscription revenue, transactional uh, video on demand, pay-per-view live, advertising sponsorship. Uh, I'm seeing now that roughly 38, I think the, th the number I, I read recently, 38% of ad dollars are, be are, are now being allocated uh, online and over the top. Um, so advertisers are beginning to increasingly put their money to that, which is a, a, ch a big change in the last uh, five, you know, five or 10 years. So um, that's just sort of an overview of uh, sort of our perspective on the market opportunity, what over, top, over the top sort of means and all that. And uh, I also want to just kind of present a couple sort of case studies, uh, use cases that we've been involved with that uh, begin to exemplify um, not Netflix, not Hulu, not Amazon, but um, underneath that um, successes uh, and early successes um, in over the and using over the top as a, as a model. So uh, USA Rugby um, is an organization that, uh, 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 that, that uh, uh, contracted with a partner of ours here in, in uh, New York, Omnigon, uh, to build a rugby experience. So uh, obviously USA Rugby, or rugby is a, uh, certainly in the US, a kind of a niche. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's not hugely popular, popular in the US, but there is an organization, USA Rugby, that has uh, a, a, a pro women's team, a men's team, uh, uh, building up the collegiate. Uh, leagues as well, and uh, has a mission, of course, of um, promoting and building up rugby as a sport um, in the U.S. So they wanted to create an experience using over the top first. They get limited TV coverage, of course. If you're a rugby fan, it's going to be very difficult for you to find uh, the rug rugby matches other than the big ones uh, occasionally. Um, so they wanted to create an experience that uh, rugby fans across the world can come and, uh, and watch um, live rugby matches, uh, uh, archived uh, video on demand, et cetera. And so we were tasked as the video platform uh, in, partnership, in partnership with Omnigon to, uh, to do a, a few things. So uh, one is that we began working with, um, I think it's one of your, um, uh, your sponsors here, Crawford Media in Atlanta, uh, to begin digitizing the library, or yeah, digitizing the library, sending boxes and boxes of tapes and discs and et cetera. Uh, Crawford digitizes that. All of that gets ingested to our platform along with the metadata. Um, for then uh, packaging and distribution through uh, the various apps that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, represent the rugby channel. But then we're also streaming um, live uh, matches. So we're receiving some of these matches through satellite. We're receiving them through uh, connection directly to venues. Um, globally, uh, this weekend, for instance, we're streaming uh, live rugby matches from Africa, from Europe and North America, all at the same time. And by the way, we have to archive those. We've got to record all those. Uh, and inject, uh, 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 work with the, uh, rugby to ingest all the metadata, et cetera, um, so that those matches can be available on demand immediately after the, um, after the, uh, the live event, so those who missed, of course, um, can come and, and, and watch. So um, uh, all of that sort of paired with um, having team information, being able to pick your favorite teams, getting, being able to schedule and get notified when your team plays in various tournaments, Etc. really begins to create a, uh, an experience um, that 
really only over the top and the inter, you know, internet based sort of applications can, uh, you know, can present. So this is, you know, in my view, sort of a world class um, experience um, and it's a, it's a subscription um, model so they sell uh, acts, all access to um, the content for um, you know, $4.99 a month and, or $49 bucks a year. You can, you can go on iOS or Google and, uh, and get those apps. Um, if you happen to be a rugby fan, uh, you can do that. Um, so that's one of our, um, you know, one of our, one of our use cases that we think really begins to exemplify, you know, the power of OTT, even for uh, a, a, a niche content provider with a niche audience, um, and uh, being able to build a, uh, you know, a business on that. Um, another one, which is uh, probably goes even more niche, is uh, last year we launched. Um, a, uh, uh, for our uh, client Moss Squared TV. Um, this is designed to be a Caribbean digital entertainment network. These are people who came out of the cable uh, industry, Comcast and Lime, et cetera, um, to build this new entertainment network. Um, the challenge was uh, that there's tons of content being created in the Caribbean, good content, um, with very little distribution out outlet, maybe YouTube, um, the broadcast systems there are largely either English or, 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 or South American. So, you know, maybe there's one or two channels that are uh, uh, focused on Caribbean content. So really uh, uh, limited outlets um, for that content. So the vision here was let's begin to aggregate content from the uh, English speaking Caribbean and then offer that out to, um, to Caribbeans or anyone really who uh, would have an interest in that globally. And what they also found on the other end of that is that the Caribbean people are very much in, in touch with their culture. Even when they leave the diaspora, uh, nationals who, are all, are, who work elsewhere, et cetera, um, still want to be very connected, um, more so than a lot of cultures, I think it seems, anyway, um, to that culture. And so this is a way, over the top, is a way for them to aggregate content, um, create an experience um, that has value, and then reach audiences globally over the top. Um, and then build a business out of it. Again, this is an SVOD, a subscription model. We also do live events during uh, Carnival in, in, in Trinidad, things of that nature where people can come and, 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 and tune in to their, um, uh, to their culture uh, easily and free on all the different apps. And it's on Roku, it's on iOS, it's on Google, it's on uh, the web, et cetera. Um, so that's a, another, um, another sort of example. <laughs> But another thing is happening, and this begins to, um, I think, begins to exemplify where this is all going. The distribution models are changing. The business models are beginning to change. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the, the actual pay TV service providers and so the, the, so the traditional uh, 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 cable companies, broadcasters, et cetera, are beginning to look now at OTT very seriously. So it's, it was a threat for a while. Um, now it's being looked at um, also as an opportunity. Um, and it is an opportunity because cable companies, broadcasters, you know, service providers still want to reach, more than ever, want to reach millennials, want to reach those type of people. And it's not just about um, getting content that's in the traditional uh, TV ecosystem to um, the devices and, and creating over the top models there. It's also about what content. So they're now looking outside of um, the, tr the traditional TV ecosystem for content and beginning to strike deals and partner and, and, and license content that's coming from digital first and coming from the web. And uh, we have two examples of those. Uh, maybe you've heard of them. It's, uh, the, most people haven't so far, um, but for, if you're a Verizon customer, you can uh, download their Go90 app. It's a mobile first app and um, it is all web content. So they're striking deals with uh, Awesomeness TV, Revision 3, GoPro Channel, um, and uh, the list goes on. Content providers that are not on the, the traditional ecosystem, they're looking for other content <coughs> to now supplement their TV model and, um, and, uh, and offer that to, uh, to their subscribers. Comcast did something similar recently called Watchable. Um, so Comcast Watchable is really the same kind of thing. It's a, uh, it's a service that's available to subscribers. It's early days for them, but they're beginning to aggregate content um, of all kinds uh, from outside the, uh, the traditional sort of pathways um, in order to begin to take advantage and use OTT as an opportunity in addition, uh, as opposed to uh, looking at it <coughs> as a threat. And so um, we actually have uh, 
Uh, we've partnered with, actually we, we bought this company in, in uh, late 2015, but Footprint TV uh, was formed in uh, early last year with the, with the idea of uh, beginning to, uh, uh, to create a multi-channel network and if you understand the term multi-channel network, um, there are companies that have built tremendous um, market value uh, by building a, a series of services for YouTube creators. Um, and and they, the, the term for that is multi-channel network. Companies like Fullscreen, if you've heard of them, Maker Studios, Awesomeness TV, Revision 3 Early Days, Machinima Early Days. Um, these, are, these are people who actually help aggregate, curate, build audience, build brand, help monetize for, for YouTube creators. And they've, tr they've built tremendous uh, market value on this concept. Full screen uh, was, uh, I think, the, the controlling interest was purchased by AT&T's churning group, Otter Media, um, which is a fund specifically uh, uh, tasked with investing in digital media. And then uh, Maker Studios was bought by Disney for, uh, I think, the, the final price was like $900 million. Um, and they, their model was to, um, was to create value from YouTube creators. So this model is now beginning to evolve off of, um, uh, like so many things do, off of YouTube, um, in addition to you know, uh, YouTube though. Um, and Footprint TV is one of those. And the idea here is that um, uh, local content is extremely relevant to not only local markets, but those who are interested in certain markets like New York, Atlanta. And uh, while local broadcasters are beginning to rethink some of their models, because they're Begin, they're sort of being circumvented by the national networks who are going direct to consumer. CBS All Access is an example. Um, so many th moving parts that broadcasters are looking for new ways to, uh, to create value. Service providers are doing the same, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, Go90 and, uh, and Watchable. So, so Footprint has a, uh, a, a vision and a mission to uh, become a multi-channel network for um, local markets. And we're starting in, uh, we're launching this uh, now we've got about 25 uh, different channels um, in, uh, of New York content. We're uh, beginning to launch that in New York, as well as um, in Atlanta. Um, earlier in Atlanta, we've only got a few, um, it's still early days. But the idea is that uh, we aggregate content for that. Um, uh, we, it'll have a direct to consumer business model associated with it, mostly sponsored and ad based. But it will also be their position to uh, be a source of content for local broadcasters and local service providers who are looking for new content to deliver over these new OTT networks. So, so many different things are happening um, in the space and, um, you know, we're trying to, uh, to be ahead of that and, and find, uh, you know, find uh, content creators and a lot of what we've, you know, I've seen today, you know, a lot of that stuff, can, that, that content can be very relevant in these new sort of distribution networks um, and that's what we're, you know, as a, as a company, that's what we're trying to uh, take advantage of and, and we're seeing it, you know, begin to happen, which is pretty exciting. So can you get down with OTT is the question, um, if you're thinking about it. And so the, the short answer, of course, from my perspective is going to be yes. Um, I'm obviously drinking the Kool-Aid. I've been doing so for quite some time. And, um, uh, but the, the, the idea is if you have high quality and relevant content and you have an audience um, that uh, sees value in that content, even better if you can uh, uh, if you can identify and reach that audience, and that's easier than ever due to social media and uh, and, and, and all the new marketing channels. Um, then uh, and you can deliver a great user experience, um, uh, whether you're doing it yourself or with partners. Then what we are effectively doing is democratizing content creation. You're democratizing content distribution, and you're democratizing monetization or ROI, however you define that. And, um, and you can do that either direct to consumer and you can do that through these new multi-channel networks that are beginning to emerge and I think over the next two or three years will emerge as sort of new distribution networks that can license and partner um, with content creators uh, to create new uh, brand new business models. Um, so all that is, uh, it, it, like, like I said, in my mind, it's very exciting and, uh, and, and we're starting to see that uh, happen today. So the internet caused a, uh, rev an evolution of television. I think we can hopefully agree on that. I think that, uh, and what we're seeing is that over the top models, multi-channel networks, the entire democratization of the, of, of, from content creation to distribution um, is really revolutionizing all of that. And meanwhile, the consumers on the other side 
have clearly said that's how we want our content. We want it anywhere, anytime, any place, on our terms, et cetera. Um, the key is high quality content, reaching them, having creating value, and delivering a great user experience. Uh, but even if you're a niche provider with a very niche audience, um, uh, we're seeing today that that could be very profitable and, uh, and, and a viable business plan. So just a quick note on us um, in Davo, in case you don't know us, we're a cloud-based platform, a turnkey platform for managing, distributing, and monetizing uh, digital media, uh, digital content. Um, everything from content ingestion all the way out to distribution and apps. Uh, we're an app developer for all the various mobile devices and TVs and uh, set-top boxes, et cetera. Um, and the creation of uh, sort of next generation networks like we think Footprint TV is an example. So that's us, just real quick. Um, there's the photo credit. Don't <laughs> <laughs> call me on that one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but if you want to find out more of this, our contact information. Um, uh, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll do my best. Great. Thanks, Paul. So if I could just do a quick recap, as for someone who has a, you know, a, a collection of content, let's say a, a thousand hours or something of content that they have the rights to, the, or the options are kind of a subscription-based model, an ad-based model, or am, am I right in understanding the MCN as a, a licensing, that I would license content to a multi-channel network? Yeah, and it's not either or. So the system... Um, you know, the, the platforms out there, including us, are designed to be very flexible in how you build your business model. So, for instance, you, if you had that thou those thousand hours in our platform, for instance, then you can package that up and organize it the way you want it, obviously, to be delivered as an experience. But then you can wrap subscriptions, um, individual transactions like movie rentals or if you have live, pay-per-view live, and advertising and license that content through the system and we've got the business models all sort of worked out. So it's never either or. The key there is flexibility because it's so, it, we're in, in such early days, uh, unless you're Netflix, there's a lot of, you know, uh, st still some uncertainty because it's an emerging market about what business models are gonna work for your audience. And the key there is to, uh, to be able to test and do some testing out there and find out what's gonna work and then build. And that's, that's sort of the way we're built is to help do that. Take it easy on me, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> the last one of the day, man. <laughs> so uh, I was watching Family Guy the other day, as I'm, I'm wont to do, and uh, there was some plot element about watching a video online. And if you're familiar with Family Guy, the character Stewie, just you know, as Family Guy does, kind of takes an aside, and he, sh he, he gestures at the Fox logo bug in the corner of the screen. He's like, yeah, these guys are done. Ooh. And that, that may be a little extreme, I, yeah. I would hope so for Fox's sake, but obviously as you spoke to, a lot of changes are happening and, and a lot of this value that's being created by folks like the MCNs and the Endavos of the world, it's not coming from nowhere, a lot of it is coming straight off of the share prices of some of the established media distribution companies, right? The, the big six, et cetera. So if you could put on your Johnny Carson mystic hat for a moment, and look at the next five years. I'm curious, you know, just again, where the market is going with some of the, the big media companies, CPMs and how those are adjusting between online and traditional linear, and CPM, if you don't know, is the cost per thousand impressions for an advertiser, and it's frankly what pretty much the entire commercial media industry is based around. And so I'm just curious, five years out, I mean, what are the additional changes? Because it just seems like this is accelerating, if anything. Uh, just from your personal perspective, not even in Davos, necessarily. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a zero-sum game. I think the music industry um, proved a lot of different things, and I think the video industry is different. Um, but I don't necessarily see it as, you know, it's either online or TV. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the TV distribution networks, the, the, you know, the big networks are going to be around. They are looking to reinvent themselves. They are looking to now more so than they were two or three years ago, at least uh, uh, acknowledge. So in their 12-step program, they've acknowledged OTT. So they're 98% cured already. So that's good <laughs> for them. Um, so there, are, there are certain, so I, I think there's a lot of pressure on like the, the broadcasters, the local broadcasters are seeing tremendous pressure now because they're, you know, if you're a local broadcaster, you're doing the local news. No one's watching the news on um, TV at six o'clock by appointment anymore. Certainly not many. 
um, and they're getting older, the ones that are. Um, so as an example, that they have to reinvent their models. And service providers are a little bit in, you know, they, they've held on to the content for so long, but you see the FCC, for example, is beginning to, they're, they're, it, under, you know, uh, the, under Wheeler, he's beginning to try to untie that stuff, content rights, et cetera, and, and, and unforce those bundles. That is playing into the trend and is playing into consumers having more flexibility, getting access more online, and I think that just, uh, I think that bodes well for uh, generally over the top, and I think the ones on the traditional pay TV side have to reinvent themselves uh, in some capacity, or the golden goose is gonna be, uh, uh, at some point, I think stops laying eggs, frankly. It's my personal opinion. What do, you, what do you think about subscription fatigue, right? I'm a, as an individual, am I gonna have 40 subscriptions to 40 different channels? It's a great, um, it's a great question, and uh, the, the, the truth is that you know, the jury's still out on it. I mean, the, fa the fact is you're still paying 100 or so dollars per month on average for cable TV, you know, and, and people still believe that I'm paying for the two or three channels that I watch, and I'm, but I'm also paying for all the others that I'm not watching. So I think perception is still that I'm overpaying over there. So if you, you know, uh, there is that possibility, and it certainly is uh, a valid question: is if I've got a, uh, uh, if I've got to um, uh, uh, subscribe to Netflix and Hulu and this and this and this, all, does that add up? Um, it'll be interesting. You know, it, some people may say, "Hey, I'd rather pay $120 for everything that I like." versus $100 for a few things that I like. So I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, it, uh, the jury's still out and I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, back and forth on uh, the business model. But it's, but people are willing to pay, obviously. Hi, Christy. Hey. Hi. Uh, I do stuff. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think has been sort of interesting in watching this uh, evolve is I still don't see a very clever way to learn about things I don't already know. And I mean as a consumer. If I've never heard of your show, or I didn't know that rugby was a thing that women played, I honestly didn't know that. Um, the tough part in all of these kind of silo distribution systems is there's really not still a good way for me to discover things I didn't already know about. Yeah. How do you see this industry, or do you yet, seeing people starting to do search across systems or across ecosystems or across different kinds of processes to, to kind of happen upon stuff? There's no more 30 second spot to tell me about a new show, right, because I can't control that time. So how was that? It's a, how do you see that coming? A, another great question. It's beginning to happen, and so we're seeing companies like um, Roku, for instance, uh, begin to allow you to search across the platform, across channels. So it's all about metadata, right? I mean, so he who holds that <laughs> pot of gold is going to have a lot of influence on that, and that's very disparate at the moment um, from all these different places where content comes from. Um, uh, so I, and, and I actually, you know, I, I agree with you 100%. I think that, that that has a long way to go. Of course, Netflix has put millions into, millions upon millions into building their recommendation engines, but of course, that's just Netflix. Um, but they're doing a, you know, and if you watch Netflix, you know, I mean, you can go on and on and on and on, and they're going to have recommendations for you. So they have, you know, uh, alg algorithms upon algorithms, I guess. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that exemplifies the fact that this is still an emerging market. And uh, I, I'm, I'm certain that someone's gonna come along and be that sort of IMDB or you know whatever it is that is sort of the aggregator of content uh, and metadata that can be searched on and, dis and, and discovered. But you're right, it's not there yet. Don't, don't have the answer. Hi, so uh, David Neary. Hi. Um, following on from what you said about the Netflix algorithm, um, Earlier, Diane showed us these, the level of um, uh, metadata in the SNL app yep. and how can I feel the specificity of that. And whereas as a user of Netflix, I find their, I find very shut out by their metadata. A lot of um, people do, it uh, seems. Yeah. Best example I'll give is I'm a big Japanese movie fan and um, uh, they, had, they used to have a lot of the Godzilla movies on there. And the fourth Godzilla movie is called Ghidorah, the Three-Headed Monster. And I typed in Godzilla into the search engine, and all the movies with Godzilla in the title came up, but the fourth Godzilla movie didn't come up because it doesn't have Godzilla searching on the titles. title. Yeah. So yeah, um, and um, so I just feel, uh, Hulu's the same actually, um, I find, I'm just wondering. And if you share your password, it's even worse. 
just, no, just is it is it in their best interest to kind of block people out of the out, out of the, the metadata like that? And do you think it's sustainable? Um, I don't think it's sustainable. Um, I mean, it's, it's a it's a tough question. Um, you mean from Netflix's standpoint? Yeah, I think from from the larger from the larger, you know, the ones that hold the, the you know the oligopoly. At the yeah, it's probably in their you know, or maybe they perceive. I don't know how if they perceive that to be in their best interest or if they're just building. You know, they've got such a massive uh, subscriber base now that it's you know behooves them to uh, just keep you there, right? I mean, it's territorial. So uh, in that way, I, I assume yes. But ultimately, just like um, you know, the, the 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 cable companies did come around and, and create value. Um, for the user by pulling together all the networks and providing a, uh, a single, you know, uh, program guide that allows you to search, um, you know, it's an old user experience that has probably been, uh, you know, uh, is, 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 is perhaps outdated now, but because there's so much metadata, but that concept I think will come along um, and someone, it's a huge opportunity I think for someone to come along and, uh, and take that and begin to you know, if, if enough people, if enough companies do it, then the Netflixes of the world, I think, will, you know, will be a part of that. Hi, uh, Dave Miller with EMAM. Um, more of a, a very open-minded question, but democrat democratization. That's another hard democratization. word. Democratization. Thank you. <laughs> of content. So 20 years ago, I had an idea. I had to get a bu book publisher publish a book, right? So to what extent, last year, two years ago, five years ago, I had a studio or, or a, a network to, to buy my content to get it on the air. So how do you see the future going with, with everybody who's got a, an idea and YouTube and then OTT and everything else uh, moving forward of anything can get out there. So this afternoon I can go home and, and watch some stuff from streaming uh, Trinidad Tobago, which I don't know how I would have done that in the past. So how do you think it's going to change the landscape in, in five years, as Nick would say? Well, I mean, I think it's going to change uh, remarkably for the benefit of the two. I mean, that's, that's why my disintermediation is my favorite word, because it, it, it really is taking out all of, potentially taking out all of the middlemen in between content creation and consumption. And um, so if you have enough high quality content, enough you know, content and can go out and, and begin to build your business. It takes marketing, of course. It takes, you know, all these different things. That's, it's, not a, it's not magic, but um, if you can do it successfully, then there is no reason that your content can't reach your consumers. And if they have, if, if it's valuable to them, they're going to pay for it or, you know, give you a return one, one way or the other. But then there's these other new sort of networks that are going to, I believe, make it easier for, like YouTube did for, uh, cat videos and uh, as well as some premium they've got you know uh, I mean, look at what the GoPro challenges did the GoPro channel in in literally NAB last month they launched on Roku they're now everywhere and they have a huge amount of, uh, of, of volume on content that's mostly user generated um, that has value to people and so it I mean that, that's that's a remarkable case study of how quickly you can gain an audience um, using over the top um, with a very niche and specific sort of, you know, type of content, and they're doing it to sell more cameras, right? I have a question for the audience. Of, of the people in here, how many are from organizations that are content holders? And, and of you, how, how many have, have either gone down the path of OTT or have discussed it with some level of seriousness? Two. So if, oh. Small percentage, yeah. really. Yeah, Small and percentage. and <laughs> is that because of rights issues? Is that why you're not pursuing that? Or I see some heads shaking. Yes, still very much an issue, rights, yeah. of course, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before we let Paul off the hook? Just I know that a lot of the clients that I work with, it's not so much that it's even necessarily rights issues. It's it disrupts the existing model. Right? And the, the transition plan from what is now or what we've emerged into over the last few years and this, this idea that you don't even need a broadcaster, you don't need a distributor per se, you can just, if you make unique content, you can monetize it directly more or less. It's, you know, kind of like HBO struggled with for years and going to damn conferences and you know, talking to some HBO folks. 
before they had HBO Go, it was just we have to figure out how we do that cutover because we have so many contracts and so much revenue tied up in the existing models to suddenly just throw it online with very different structures for advertising rates or subscription models or whatever it is, different view viewerships. It's just a hard transition plan. So in my opinion, the right way to do it is you do it gradually. You gradually, as a content holder, if you do put out through the traditional broadcast mechanisms, you have to sort of start it up in parallel again through these alternative mechanisms to the point where you're generating good revenue from both mechanisms and it's easier to maybe cut over if indeed that's you know, look, look what uh, what Turner just did. Uh, they announced, uh, of course, down in my backyard in Atlanta, um, last week or maybe two weeks ago, they announced their first uh, over-the-top SVOD service called Filmstruck. And it's a, a partnership with Criterion uh, 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 Studios and it's older movies. Um, but they're putting their toe in the water. And so I, that's going to happen. And they're all going to, you know. So yeah, it's a balance. That's a challenge for us too in terms of dealing with and working with the traditional uh, infrastructure that exists is to, uh, is to balance the threat <laughs> with the opportunity and, and, and that's what we hope to do and, you know. But it happen. seems that it breaks into a couple categories, right? We have, I mean, commercial content producers, which I think you're talking about, but then you also have lots of, you know, I think a lot of people that we deal with too, like archives that have never uh, distributed their content where this is an opportunity. That might be more where the rights issues are. But yeah, both camps are dealing with that. Sorry, I interrupted somebody who was no, asking. No, I was just saying with the Turner, though, they already have the broadcasting live, and they also have an app. Turner. I'm you with that movie. Not a political no, endorsement. No. Turner. Oh, my God. That was a question I had earlier about um, how do you um, find a common language you know, when you describe a, a Trump supporter, two, there's two different views on it. You get two, two different answers. Is that the semantics? They both laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions before we let Paul off the hook? Thank you very All much. All right, thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.